particular board meeting of the Poway Unified School District Board of Education on June 6, 2019. It is now 6.06 .06 p.m. This is a notice to all those in attendance. A recording and broadcast is being made at the direction of the board and the recording or broadcast <coughs> may capture images and sounds of those attending the meeting. And now we may stand for the pledge. Ready, begin. We move on to agenda item 3.2, report out of closed session. Ms. Couvret. Uh, closed session began at 4.07 and the Board of Education took the following action in closed session. In the matter of pending existing litigation on case number 201812-0608 on a motion by Zane and a second by O'Connor Radcliffe, the board voted to approve the final settlement. The vote of the board were all unanimous with Patel, O'Connor Radcliffe, Kuvret, and Zane in the affirmative. Um, Beatty was absent. 2.1-A-2 um, in the matter of pending existing litigation case number 201903-0576 on a mo motion of O'Connor Radcliffe and a second by Zane. The board voted to approve the final settlement. The vote um, was unanimous again with Patel, O'Connor Radcliffe, Kufrad and Zane in the affirmative and Beatty was absent. 2.3-A through I there was no reportable action from closed session. The board will take action in open session. Agenda items 8.1 and 8.2. 2.4-A, there was no reportable action. 2.6-B, in the matter of public employee appointment and employment for principal of Oak Valley Middle School and a motion by Zane and a second by O'Connor Radcliffe, the board voted to take action in closed session to appoint Mr. Colin Young as principal of Oak Valley Middle School. The vote was <laughs> and the vote was for and unanimous with Patel, O'Connor, Radcliffe, Kuvret, and Zane the affirmative and Beatty absent. There was no other reportable action during closed session. This closed session adjourned at 5.56. At this time, I'd like to say congratulations to Mr. Young and invite him up to make a statement if he'd like. You can bring your daughter too. She looks excited. <laughs> your daughter? <or> yeah. <laughs> so where's daddy gonna be working? At Oak Valley Middle School. Are you excited? Yes. Why are you excited? Because I get to run around <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm very excited. Um, I appreciated speaking with you guys today. And um, my kids are excited. And I look forward to getting to work right away. And it's a fantastic school. And I can't wait to be a part of the Falcon family. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Congratulations. And we're excited. <laughs> At this time, I'd like to pause for a moment of silence for a student from Willow Grove Elementary School who passed away due to health complications. Henry was a fifth grade critical skills student who was loved by the Willow Grove staff. Although he had some physical challenges with his, <coughs> although he had some physical challenges with his passing, it came as quite a shock to all of us. Our thoughts and prayers are with Henry's family during this difficult time. Will you please join me in a moment of silence? Thank you. And now looking at members in attendance, we have uh, all members in attendance except for Ms. Uh, Kimberly Beatty. And now for our welcome to the public, Mr. Schwartz. I think this is your last one. Welcome to the monthly meeting of the Board of Education. 
If you'd like to address the board on any agenda item, please complete a speaker slip. All requests to speak must be submitted to the clerk of the board before the agenda item comes up. If you are requesting an agenda item be pulled for public discussion from Section 5.0 Consent Calendar, a speaker slip must be submitted to the clerk now, as approval of the consent calendar is one of the first items up for approval. Item 4.2 is placed on our agenda to enable members of our community to bring items that are not placed anywhere else on the agenda to the board's attention. Speaking time is limited to 3 minutes per speaker with a maximum of 15 minutes per topic unless waived by the board president. There will be a 30 second yellow warning light when time is running out. Speakers may only speak on one topic under item 4.2 and may not defer their speaking time to another individual. If there are concerns regarding specific individuals, it's preferred that the speaker refrain from naming them publicly to respect their privacy. The board will accept any review and review any written materials that would provide more specific information. The Brown Act does not permit board action or extended discussion of any item not on the agenda, but your concerns will be referred to staff. With that said, welcome and thank you for coming. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. Dr. Phelps? I want to start off by first thanking Jake Schwartz, our student board member, for his service this past year. This is his last meeting as our student board member. Jake has been a constant presence here at our board meetings as well as in the district office, served also serving on my superintendent student advisory council and on other committees. He dove right into his position meeting uh, with the district leaders as well as other student leaders at all of our schools to gain a better grasp of the issues that are affecting our district. He took the time to study and understand complicated items on the agenda including the budget, textbook adoptions and more. And through it all, Jake has always had a positive attitude, he's proactive, and he's wise beyond his years. Jake, I thank you for your service. Um, you will certainly be missed. We wish you good luck at George Washington University and congratulate you, and we're really proud of you. And so I thank you for serving our board and serving our district in the capacity that you have and being a student leader. Um, we know that you'll do well moving forward. We have a small gift for you uh, to com commemorate your time with us. I also like to thank you for the time you served sitting next to Trustee Zane. I know that was a lot of work as well, too. <laughs> <laughs> but congratulations. Thank you, Jake. We will miss you and hope that you stay in touch over the years. It's always nice to have student board members come back and speak to us. Next, we'll move on to agenda item 3.5. This is an action item, approval of the agenda sequence. Do we have any changes to the agenda sequence? We have a motion for approval? Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. And a motion by O'Connor Ratcliffe, second by Zane. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. Schwartz? Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. <coughs> and that brings us to our oral reports. Agenda item 4.1. Student board reports. Do we have Jamie Souza from Abraxas High School? Please step up. Welcome. You guys look a lot more intimidating than you, pr than you probably are. It's like a... <laughs> Old Congress thing. All right. Hello, and thank you for allowing me per to present to the board. My name is Jamie Souza. We have two programs at Abraxas High School, the Diploma Program and the Transition Program. I'm a student in the Diploma Program. The Transition Program is for young adults, 18 to 22, who learn important life skills at Abraxas and in the community. The students in their in the transition program are wrapping up another year of working on their mobility skills using MTS to learning uh, using MTS learning to grocery shop cooking and working on their overall independence the students have also worked or volunteered at a variety of job sites in the community the transition program graduation will be held on June 13th and 11 students have completed the program the leadership Club has held four blood drives and volunteers have donated 140 units of blood, well beyond our goal of 120 units for the year. The Leadership Club has also organized the first ever Abraxas Prom, which will be held at the school this Saturday evening. I 
I'm looking forward to it. The construction program, which is available to all high school students in PUSD, is finishing up another tiny home project. 20 students are taking the pre-apprenticeship or pre-apprenticeship level one class. Um, the students in the construction program work with students in the transition program to finish and paint smaller projects. Students from both the diploma and transition programs participate in the Abraxas Garden Project. The Abraxas Garden continues to donate most of the produce to needy families in our community and that has now donated over 6,000 pounds of produce to the needy. The Abraxas Garden will have its second annual fundraising event on June 15th from 9 a.m. to noon. I'd love to see some of you guys there if you have free time. And uh, that's it, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I hope that wasn't too intimidating. We were all right. <laughs> Next we'll have Alexis Long from Del Norte High School. Good evening, board members and audience. For those of you who don't know me yet, my name is Alexis Long, and I will be serving as Del Norte's ASB president over the next school year. With the school year coming to an end, Del Norte has found ways to keep the school spirit alive and promote unity within our campus. I'm excited to share with you what our school has done continually to maintain our motto of being college ready, future focused, and globally aware. College ready. Graduation is coming closer, and we are so happy to say that over 93% of our seniors are going to college or junior college after high school. Our seniors, our seniors worked hard throughout the year, and along with the rest of the students, they took part in the collective 2,300 AP exams handed out in May. Finals are next week, and many plan on pushing through with their best effort. Future focused. With the past incident involving the Havada Poway, our students took act action and publicized the fundraiser for victims and the synagogue. In addition, during our homerooms, classes wrote letters of love and sympathy to members of the church and first responders. We sent around 500 letters to show that we are with them and here for anyone. A lot of emphasis is placed on home court advantage at Del Norte, and we believe that people do their best when thousands are holding them up and loving them. We tried our best to emulate that sense a lot this past month, and it has brought our school and community closer together as one. The following week, we had an Each Mind Matters week, highlighting the importance of maintaining a healthy mental state through high school and life. Students learn the importance of, of mental health and how to keep it consistent beyond high school and in our future careers. Globally aware. Our campus does its very best to highlight the diversity in our community as well. A club known as South Asian Culture Club combined the with a chapter at Westview to showcase cultural dances to the public. Students with various backgrounds join this club to learn and gain experience with something new and different. Last weekend, our junior class presidents planned and hosted prom. We beat the record of, record of overall tickets sold for prom in Del Norte's history with 200 more sold than before. The previous week, ASB held its last pep rally of the school year with the theme of decades and we tried to feature students with, from various friend groups and extracurriculars. The senior class presidents also organized a girls flag football game in which all of the proceeds would aid one of our freshmen's medical costs in his fight against cancer. We had such a big turnout that night. Del Norte has created quite an inclusive and loving environment and I'm so grateful that we are ending the school year on this note. As I conclude, I would like to thank the audience and board members for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. I look forward to updating you more about our Nighthawks. It's great to be distinctively Del Norte. Thank you. Thank you. And our last board our student report is Tyler Vandenberg <coughs> from Mount Carmel High School. Welcome. Good evening, Power Unified Board. My name is Tyler Vandenberg, and I'm very pleased, yet saddened, to inform all of you on all the amazing things going on at Mount Carmel for the very last time. In some recent news, this past Saturday, Mount Carmel inducted many accomplished individuals into our brand new Hall of Fame. One particular individual inducted was Billy Bean. Bean was a two-time Mount Carmel athlete and was also drafted 23rd in the first round draft pick by the New York Mets. Last week, we also had our Sun Devil standout breakfast where each teacher chooses one student that embodies the Sun Devil way inside and outside of the classroom. This award, in my opinion, is one of the most prestigious awards at Mount Carmel. A Sun Devil standout to me is a Sun Devil that strives to be the best person they can be in all aspects of MC. Whether it's in the classroom, to sports practice, the lunch tables, or even in passing periods, these people embody all characteristics a part of the Sun Devil way and continue to carry these character characteristics through the rest of their life. 
Last night was our Athlete of the Year ceremony, where Tyler Green and Mara Miranda were both announced Athlete of the Year. At the ceremony, Mount Carmel also recognized many other athletes for their many accomplishments. May 1st through the 3rd was our annual One Acts, held at the Mount, also known as our Performing Arts Center. Students directed, acted, and produced all of the plays. These students spent the entire month of April preparing during and after school and as well as spring break. May 23rd and 24th was the Legends Choir Concert, where Sun Devils from all levels of choir performed 70s and 80s themed music. This was one of the biggest concerts of the year and everyone had an awesome time. We are also very proud of our students, their families, and our teachers who earned for the fourth year in a row the California Honor Roll designation by Educational Results Partnerships. This is for student achievement and closing achievement gaps. As this year comes to an end, I would like to wish all the seniors a fun and successful future, and to all the seniors at Mount Carmel, I will miss you all. Thank you so much for listening, and it has been such a wonderful and humbling experience to speak to you all here and serve as the Mount Carmel community rep. Have a wonderful sum summer, and remember, it's great to be a Sun Devil. So I'm sure some of you have finals to worry about. You are welcome to leave if you don't want to stay. Otherwise, you're welcome to stay. Thank you. That brings us to agenda item 4.2, public comments. Ms. Cabret. Janet Latang. Good evening, Superintendent Kim Phelps, Superintendent's Council and Trustees. First of all, uh, I wanted to say congratulations to Khan Young and we'll miss you at PHS. Um, with the close of the academic school year, um, I'd like to share with you some of the visual and performing arts highlights th from this year. Um, let's see. The PUSD middle school and high school students participated in over 140 VAPA performances since last August. It was helpful to have a VAPA calendar published on the district website this year, and I hope that that continues on into our years to come. Um, on, a, on a different note, um, 50 P PUSD students received recognition from the 9th District PTA Heroes Around Me Reflections Contest. Most of the winners submitted entries in the following VAPA areas, dance choreography, film, film production, music composition, and visual arts. And those areas of VAPA don't often get recognized, so it's just wonderful that we had 50 students who were recognized on the district uh, PTA level. Um, uh, can't forget that Mount Carmel High School Marching Band took first place in the district regional marching band competition for the fourth year in a row. Um, that RB High School Band Director Duane Otani was selected for the prestigious Gold Award of Recognition from the Southern California School Band and Orchestra Association. Seven middle school students made California All-State Middle School Band 19 PUSD students were selected for all state honor um, high school band and orchestra, and 13 PUSD students were selected for the 2019 California All State Choir. Um, and two students were selected for the 2018 NAFME All National Ensembles. So we have some stellar, stellar um, um, musicians and performers in our district. Um, in February, the district received over 470 LCAP comments in support of visual and performing art programs in PUSD. This is a tremendous community support of the district's VAPA program. Um, the VAPA Strategic Task Force completed the district's visual and performing arts strategic plan and made a presentation to the board in March, setting into motion for next year the implementation of the first year of the plan. And finally, I'd just like to say many thanks to the VAPA teachers who worked endlessly to give um, all their students these art learning opportunities. These VAPA students are able to follow their passion through their participation in their VAPA classes, thanks to all of you. And thank, finally, thank you to the district for your support of our VAPA staff, programs, and students. It's been a successful arts year. Thank you. Seeing no other comments, that brings us to agenda item 4.3, which is uh, College Bound Program, Poway Unified School District Program with Carol Osborne. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Patel. Tonight, I am pleased to provide the board with information regarding the impact and learning that the College Bound Program has provided our students and families this year. During the academic year, College Bound engages scholars and families in discussions and presentations that deepen their understanding of study skills and time management, reviewing and understanding their transcript, financial aid and scholarships, and A to G requirements, to name just a few. Tonight, Dr. Darlene Willis, founder of the College Bound Program, and Mercedes Hubschmidt, director of state and federal programs for LSS, will co-present information regarding the impact and learning for our college bound scholars and families. Let's go up to the dais. Good evening. I'm Dr. Darlene Willis, the co-founder and executive director of Concerned Parents Alliance. Um, and I'm just delighted to be here to present this information to you. Um, so we'll just get jump right in and get started. Sharing the screen. <laughs> all right, so we'll start off with the sort of the, the initial data in terms of um, these are all of the schools you'll see a uh, variety of slides that, and this is our middle school component, our middle school scholars. We identify the students as scholars in our program. And we can keep going with this so quickly. These are our ninth and 10th graders, our 11th and 12th grade scholars. And we also serve approximately 130 parents slash guardians and or responsible adults from all of the Poway elementary, middle, and high schools, in addition to their senior or their siblings whom we refer to as our junior scholars. With a total served this year for 2018-19, 251 scholars and their parents, guardians, and or responsible adults slash families. Thank you, Dan. At our March 29th College Bound Monthly Meeting, we collected perception data from both our student scholars and their parents regarding different aspects of their College Bound experience. As you can see, 40.5% of our students have participated in College Bound for two years. 35.1% have just completed their first year in the program. As we review the following perception data, we recognize that how our children perceive themselves as students is really important. When we asked our scholars, to what degree did you per perceive yourself as a highly effective student before College Bound, a little more than half agreed. However, after their participation in the program, their self-perception as a highly effective student rose significantly to 92%. College Bound offers many types of supports. Amongst those is increasing the knowledge and awareness of our students and relevant topics to ensure their educational success. In looking at the data displayed on the slide, one can surmise some of the positive outcomes of the College Bound experience. Of note are the high percentage of students understanding the CSU, UC, A through G requirements to apply for those college systems, knowledge of scholar scholarship opportunities, and understanding college admission requirements. The next few slides speak to the College Bound parent experience. As we examine our parent data, you will note that almost 40% of parents have participated in College Bound for at least two years. Approximately 30% of our College Bound parents have participated in College Bound for four or more years. As they may have scholars at varying grade levels throughout the years, continued participation reflects the value our families have for the program. As we consider the impact of College Bound for parents, 76% of our parents felt like they were engaged in their students' education before College Bound. This number increased to 100% of families feeling engaged after their college bound experience. When we asked our parents how their participation in college bound impacted their involvement, you will note that those crucial understandings regarding scholarship opportunities, A through G, and college admissions requirements for their students reflected above 90% of feeling more involved. Accessing advanced placement courses has served as an indicator in accessing the rigor of college-level coursework. As we look at our African-American students district-wide, comparatively, 
a higher number of our college-bound students in grades 9 through 12 enrolled in at least one advanced placement class. And when we isolate the percentage of just seniors who took at least one AP class, you will see a significant difference in the percentage of college-bound students undertaking at least one AP class compared to African-American seniors overall in our district. This past year, this reflected as a 27% difference. Earlier, we shared the percentage of our students and parents who are aware and understood the A3G requirements. We see the value of this knowledge when examining the A3G completion rate of our college-bound seniors. In 2017-18, the percentage of college-bound seniors who completed A3G requirements was higher than our overall district percentage of 78%. As we close the 2018-19 school year, we are excited to learn of the update for this metric. Attendance at monthly college-bound meetings is important in order to access the support. This year, you will see that the attendance of our college-bound evenings has increased from 10%, well, decreased 10% from last year. Through College Bound's targeted work with seniors, 100% of our seniors took either the SAT or ACT in preparation for their college application season. And finally, we recognize the cost of financing a college education, whether through grants, scholarships, or loans. To that end, we are excited to share that 100% of our College Bound seniors completed the free application for federal student aid, an important step in securing funding for our post-secondary education. And so this slide indicates the uh, graduating class of 2019. Um, these are the universities that they applied to. Some are not on there, but these are majority of them in which they applied and were accepted. And then the next slide actually gives you the breakdown of our 12 senior scholars and the universities that they are attending. The two that are attending the community college actually chose to attend the community college due to athletics. And our guest speakers, as you can see, uh, the superintendent, along with the associate superintendent, Carol Osborne, trustees Patel, Kubret, O'Connor Ratcliffe, and principals were at our finale program, which was amazing, where we highlighted our year as well. UCSD, once again, as one of our partners, um, helped with financial aid workshop, and then we went into detail uh, about the, how, from a parent's perspective, that they can secure funding, obtain it. Transcript review with our very own Mercedes. Um, there was a PUSD climate check-in with the Associate Superintendent Carol Osborne. Um, President Ricky Shabazz from San Diego City College was a keynote speaker and actually invited us to his campus and we went and attended his campus. And then there was a school board candidate forum as well. And these, um, I wanted to stop here for a moment because we every year acknowledge VIPs, and these are PUSD staff um, that have made a difference, whether that's a teacher, a counselor, a principal, a, a district level, or in, in the school sites that have made a difference in our scholars' lives. And these are just uh, the ones that were acknowledged that evening, but we have three that were not able to be there, and I just would like to acknowledge them. They are here today, and I just want them to come forward because and this is personal to me because Los Penasquitos Elementary School, to me, in my opinion, is one, is the, one of the best kept secrets in this district. And they, I, yeah, they're saying, shh, don't say it, right? <laughs> uh, and they are led by an amazing principal who goes over and beyond. And those of you know, we are raising our great uh, nephews that are here tonight, Matthew and Robert. And so in this process, the scholars had to nominate who made that difference. And so if Ms. McLaughlin would please come forward, who is the principal. The <laughs> who is the first grade teacher. Uh, and Ms. Laura Aquista, who could not make it, her son is on the all-star baseball team. But I'm going to ask Robert and Matthew, because they are the ones that nominated you, to please come forward and just give you something on their behalf, on behalf of College Bound. <laughs> How about a hug or something, Rob? <laughs> Matthew? <laughs> Matthew is, is being promoted.
but they are just amazing. The, everyone on here was really amazing. All of them were VIPs. And again, to show the dedication, the others were there at our finale program and we were able to recognize them and the superintendent and the president also recognized them. But I just, I, I, it would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge them tonight in this program uh, and the things that they do. So we appreciate them. These are sort of what we're calling our College Bound Poway News. Uh, we are partners with College Board and ACT in which our scholars have the ability to, re to earn or to receive um, waivers in taking these college prep tests. We are also partnered with the City of San Diego, which provides some scholarship dollars. Academic excellence is our priority. And another partner is San Diego Gas and Electric, the Semper Energy Utility. These are just some of the highlighted scholarships that were given out. Bobby Jones Scholarship, Dream Big, all of these donated um, from private donors. Pernola and Philip Willis Sr., Rising Scholars. And the last one is very personal to me, and that's the Sean E. Washington II Scholarship. That is a scholarship that was given to Jeremiah Wright. And Sean Washington was my nephew that suddenly passed away April 26 at the age of 29. So just goes to show that life is precious and it was an honor for our family to give that award to JJ. This is our college bound, the state legislators uh, for the state of California declared April 22nd as the official college bound day. It was uh, unanimously approved. We, it kicked off the start of our um, college tour for the week and so Within there, you'll see state legislatures as well as those scholars that were selected to be on the floor. Literally, we were on the floor and the rest were in the galley. It was just amazing, um, an, an amazing opportunity. We also, Concerned Parent Alliance, partnered with the Oakland A's and had the first ever College Bound Night. So you'll see us presenting a College Bound shirt to the president of the Oakland A's and we are working on trying to do something similar uh, with the Padres, so we'll keep you posted on that. But the mayor of Oakland is in there, the Alameda County office uh, superintendent as well. Uh, it was a great night. The scholars actually threw out the first pitch. So that's our goal to try to get it here in Southern California. This, um, we have partnered, our nonprofit actually was asked by the University of California to partner with them. And in that partnership, we brought together 27 uh, community-based organizations throughout San Diego County. So this picture represents those organizations and our goal is to help the UC increase their pipeline for students of color and it's going along very well. And as you can see, State Assembly Member Weber was at our, this was our first conference we had along with the Honorable Randa Trapp as our keynote speakers. This is very exciting too, Concerned Parent Alliance College Bound Programs was the only San Diego community-based organization that was invited to the Michelle Obama's National College Signing Day at UCLA. Yes, it was exciting um, and we were able to bring about 100 people there with families and um, again, like I said, we were the only one and hopefully that will be extended. It was the fifth National Solid College Signing Day, but the first one on the West Coast. So we're excited about that. And this is just an example. In the middle, very important are our staff. They work day and night uh, to help make this program a success. This is just giving you a glimpse into College Bound from the orientation. And if you see the picture on the left, there are seniors and their parents making a commitment to one another. Uh, and can't see it now, but literally tears just strolling down their face. And here's another one. We actually had a family day thanks to uh, Mrs. Smith who helped us do a college bound bowling night or bowling day. Uh, she and her family and that's a glimpse if you come to college bound and you'll see how active the scholars sit in the front, the um, parents and guardians sit in the back. And we just like to thank you personally um, and professionally from this organization, because remember, College Bound started right here in Poway, and that started in 2001, and it's still going strong, so we cannot thank you enough for always supporting us, for allowing us to be your partners, 
and um, any questions you have, we're here to answer them, but thank you, thank you. On behalf of, I want the families that are here to please stand, the College Ground families that were able to make it. And they're just as excited as I am, and I always, I'll leave this uh, on our, this is our College Bound motto as well as our affirmation that says, I believe in myself. I love myself. I am the most important person in the world. I can think for myself, so no one will have to tell me what to think. Success will not come to me. I will have to go and get it. I believe in treating people the way I want to be treated because I know that I know that I know that I am college bound. Thank you very much. We appreciate you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the board? No? Thank you. That brings us to agenda item 5.1, approval of the consent calendar. The items listed under consent agenda are considered routine and will be approved or adopted by a single motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items. However, any individual item may be removed from the consent calendar upon request of any member of the board, discussed and acted upon separately. The superintendent and staff recommend approval of all consent items. We'll go down the row. Mr. Schwartz, do you have any items to report? Mr. Zane? No. Ms. Tibet? Ms. O'Hunter Ratzer? And none for me. So can I hear a motion? <coughs> motion to approve. Second. On a motion by O'Connor Ratcliffe, second by Mr. Zane. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 4-0. One second. We are now on agenda item 6.0, personnel support services. The first item is agenda item 6.1, approval of California School Boards Association, CSBA Board Policies 4000 Series. Mr. Jimenez. Thank you, President Patel. At the May 9th board meeting, the board was presented and received several board policies within the 4000 Series for a first reading and review. These policies are aligned with those of the California School Boards Association, and these policies have also been reviewed by staff. Uh, the board is asked to approve the policies at this evening's board meeting. Thank you. Are there any questions? <coughs> is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second. On a motion by Mr. Zane, second by Ms. O'Connor Ratcliffe. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Oh, sorry, Mr. Schwartz? Motion carries 5-0. Action item 6.2. Approval of resolution number 71, 2019, entitled Resolution Regarding the Elimination of Classified Positions as Contained Within Exhibit A, Corresponding Layoff of Classified Employees. Mr. Jimenez. Thank you, President Mattel. This item calls for the board action to reduce the hours of two crossing guard positions at Meadowbrook Middle School and to eliminate one physical education instructional aid position at Creekside Elementary due to either a lack of work or a lack of funds. Uh, based on concerns that were raised by our uh, classified organization, PSEA, pertaining to position number two, which we want to address, staff recommends this evening that the board adopt the resolution, but that the motion state that the resolution be adopted with position number two deleted from Exhibit A. Thank you. Are there any questions? Is there a motion? Motion to approve as recommended. Do you have a second? Second. On a motion by Mr. Zane, second by Ms. O'Connor Ratcliffe. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries as modified. Thank Four you. zero. Thank you. We are now on agenda item 7.0, business support services. Item number 7.1 is a public hearing, and at this time, I'd like to convene the public hearing at 6.45. And we have a public hearing of 2019-2020 proposed budget. This is a first reading. Are there any comments on this item? Public comments? No? 
Mr. Little, you may proceed. Yes, thank you, Dr. Patel. Good evening, board members, community members, uh, staff, and community members. Uh, this evening, we share for the board's consideration uh, the first reading of our district's proposed 1920 budget for next year. Uh, I'd like to thank the finance team, uh, Ms. Ramiro and her team, for all the hard work they've put into this. This is the agenda that we'll look at briefly this evening. As the, I'm not going to read this whole quote for you. Uh, I know you're disappointed. But as the nation experiences the longest economic expansion in history, and as the global economic landscape slows to its lowest pace in three years with trade volatility on the horizon, Governor Newsom's May revise is both prudent and optimistic. Prudent in the sense that he continues the prior governor's practice of contributing significantly to the rainy day fund, which will be instrumental in weathering the next economic downturn when it comes, and optimistic in that his budget for California is predicated on the state's continued, albeit slower, economic growth. The brief uh, LAO quote here basically uh, argues that although the tax receipt revenues uh, that have, although they've outpaced uh, projections uh, that were in the governor's January proposal by a little over $3 billion, given the constraints by, uh, of the uh, state constitution and other factors, there's little available for any new additional commitments on the part of the governor, which is why the May revise really was not much different than what we saw in his January's budget proposal. So as I mentioned, the district's finance team has worked hard to build a conservative yet realistic 2019 budget for Power Unified based on the governor's May revise and our own local fiscal realities. You'll note uh, the, the bullet points here. We're looking at 100% LCFF funding uh, under the governor's proposal. We're looking at a slightly reduced COLA of 3.26%, uh, down slightly from his January proposal. Uh, significant one-time funds uh, to help offset or mitigate some of the STRS employer contribution costs, uh, as well as some new ongoing special education funding, uh, which unfortunately, given its restrictions, we would not benefit from. You can see the UPP requirements, which we don't meet, uh, although we'll find out later that our special enrollment does exceed uh, the requirement. Uh, just as a side note, uh, the, his special ed proposal, of course, has been rejected uh, by both the, the Assembly and the Senate in the state. So uh, they're still working around the special ed funding and figuring out uh, how to solve it by the time they bring the budget trailer bill to the governor for his signature on June 11th. As you also know, the governor's May revise is but a proposal. It's currently being debated in the Budget Conference Committee, which is currently considering some of these following amendments. I'm not going to read them to you, but all told, uh, these represent an additional three to five million dollars of potential resources to Poway Unified if they are adopted. And since they are not yet adopted, we have not included them uh, in our budget at this time. Similarly, here is another list of additional legislation currently being considered that could also impact next year's budget and future budgets, particularly around Prop 98 funding uh, and available resources to Power Unified. These two have not been included uh, in the proposed budget that we're going to review this evening. I, I should also mention that uh, the detail of the budget is in our multi-year projection, 11-page uh, document uh, that the board has and the public has access to. Uh, the next few slides are just going to summarize what's in that report. Enrollment drives funding, as we know, and this graph is just to show the stable enrollment growth that Poway Unified has enjoyed over the past decade. Since 2010-11, our enrollment has increased nearly 7%, or a little less than 1% per year. However, that growth has slowed recently, and in fact was slightly negative. You can see this year, uh, it's two-tenths of 1% negative this year. So we are using conservative estimates for next year's budget, 0.35% growth, as well as the subsequent two years. Similarly, uh, or compared to the 7% of total enrollment growth, since 2010, our special ed population of students has increased by nearly 37% over the same period, and as such has become a larger share of our total count of students. 
This has obvious implications to the expense side of our budget. In 2010-11, our special ed students totaled 10% of our total enrollment. Last year, our special ed population comprised 12.6% of our total enrollment. Next year, we project, I'm sorry, this year is at 13.1%, and next year, uh, we're projecting a slight increase to 13.2%. Correspondingly, uh, we anticipate our special ed budget going from $63 million this year to $68.3 million <coughs> next year. Other fiscal assumptions uh, that we're used to seeing, again, step and column costs, our STRS costs, our PERS costs, our annual increases in health and welfare costs for our employees, as well as a significant increase in our property and liability insurance premiums. In total, these account for approximately $8.3 million of increased expenditures in the proposed budget. In response to the board budget workshop that we held in January, uh, staff proposes reducing the 2019-2020 budget by about $2.5 million next year in the areas of RTI, budget standards, aquatics, as well as specific cabinet recommended departmental reductions. Here are also what has been added to budget utilizing primarily increased revenues in the case of the increase of custodial supplies. We're using the facilities use revenues to offset uh, the extra money that we're giving to sites. Uh, grant funds, which in part are going to uh, fund the increased counseling at the high schools, and capital lease funds for our computer modernization program. This is obviously a big picture of our revenues. Our projected general revenues for 2019-20 are just shy of $400 million broken out as you can see in the pie chart. And I might just note that these numbers are not gonna jive exactly with what you'll see on the LCAP because there's lots of different ways to slice the pie uh, and we're slicing it slightly different, although it's very close uh, to how uh, the LCAP team has sliced it. Our projected 2019-2020 expenditures are just shy of $411 million. Again, broken out as such. This slide is a quick snapshot at the year-over-year -year comparison of our budget revenues. Overall, fairly flat, so you can see uh, a 3.8% increase in local control funding formula funds. That's from COLA and growth, primarily. Federal revenues are down about 11%, 12%. That's primarily due to deferred revenues uh, that we had in the past year. Uh, other state revenues, you'll recall, we got a lot of one-time money this year, so we'll get less next year. Local revenue is pretty flat. Transfers in reflect a capital lease that we're anticipating to buy the computers and some copper equipment. So again, pretty flat, slightly negative, two-tenths of 1% on the revenue side. On the expenditure side, again, year-over-year -year comparison, salaries uh, remain fairly flat. Uh, books and supplies down, primarily because we've been spending carryover this year. Same with services and operating expenses and also with capital outlay. So expenditures are projected to increase slightly by about 1.2% uh, in our proposed budget. Given the governor's May revised proposal on our other fiscal assumptions that we just reviewed, we project that general fund expenditures will outpace revenues next year by approximately $10.9 million. This net activity will reduce our reserve levels to approximately 8.1%. Uh, we project at the end of this fiscal year, we'll finish the year at 10.9% of reserves. The reserves are broken out uh, as follows. I won't go through these. Uh, these are, this is what we project our ending fund balance to be for the general fund at the end of 2019-2020. Uh, this is just a note with respect to general fund contributions from our unrestricted programs to our restricted programs, and again, the year-over-year -year change, right? So special education, we're projecting to contribute about uh, 40, close to $49 million, which is about $5 million more than we did this year, uh, about $12.4 million to our routine regular maintenance account, which is about 700,000 more than this year, uh, and the TPP match will be the same, so there's no difference there. 
So turning our attention to our three-year multi-year projections, again, based on the budget assumption, assumptions, sorry, delineated, delineated in the attached budget document, uh, we project that our general fund expenditures are projected to outpace revenues uh, in all three of the years. And as a result, our reserve levels will continue uh, to decrease, reaching a low of 2.7% by 21-22. You'll recall that the state mandated reserve level as a minimum is 2%. So as we've shared many times, uh, we believe a 10% reserve level remains a prudent goal. This would represent close to two months of payroll and reserves uh, certainly below the three months that the GFOA recommends that we've talked about in the past. So we just wanted to show what it would look like to maintain those reserve levels at 10 percent. So for next year, if we could, uh, we would have to either find revenues of or expenditure reductions totaling approximately $7 million to maintain that 10 percent level. If we can't get there, uh, then in 2021, uh, if we want to maintain the 10 percent reserve level, then we're looking at approximately $18 million of additional revenues uh, or additional expenditure reductions to keep it at 10 percent. So what's next? Obviously, uh, we're hopeful that what comes out of Sacramento in the next couple weeks is positive and more positive than what the governor presented in his May revise. So as you know, the, as I mentioned, the budget committee is working through the the bills and the, his proposal, uh, they're required to have something on his desk by June 15th. Uh, I, I've heard that they're expecting to have it sooner. Um, I think they're winding down their, their work this week is what I'm hearing. So again, we, we'll watch that closely and we'll uh, work any changes into the budget that we bring back to you on June 27th. Again, hopefully all positive. Uh, we continue to work on refining the special ed numbers uh, with Greg and his team, just diving into those budgets even more closely. Uh, we're finalizing all the other funds uh, that we'll bring back to you for your review and approval. Of course, we're finalizing all the SACS reports that are required by the states that go along with the general fund and all the other funds. And I think we'll look forward to presenting uh, the proposed preliminary budget to you on June 27th. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Little. Are there any questions from the board at this time? Or comments? The $7 million of expenditure reductions or hopeful um, <laughs> revenue enhancements are above and beyond the, the cuts that we've already managed to put into that. That's correct. The two and a half million dollars of reductions were built into the budget that you see. I feel strongly that we should keep our 10 percent minimum reserve. I, I would like to see a budget that does that. Um, I'm not willing to take it to such low levels. I mean, it's, it's just three years that we're basically at the state minimum. We've always said that 10 percent was our floor, and now we're talking about going below it next year. I don't think that's acceptable to me. I would like to see a budget that shows those additional $7 million in cuts in the next two weeks. And hopefully the state's going to help with that so it's not all cuts. But I feel strongly about the 10% reserve. We haven't even seen our downturn yet. Um, and who knows when that's happening. It might be next year. It might be five years from now. But we need that budget reserve. <laughs> the state gets a rainy day fund, and we need to keep ours too. But, and that's that's minimal for a rainy day fund, frankly. We've been much higher in our reserves in the past, and we've now hit the floor. And I, I, I don't think I can vote for anything that goes below the floor of 10. That's where I'm at. Lorraine, did you want to add to that? Maybe just briefly to say I think I, I agree with that sentiment. Um, I prefer when you come and give a report where you find millions of dollars instead of um, I am uh, cognizant of the fact that, you know, roughly a year ago, I think we were looking at about a $15 million social budget deficit. Uh, 11 million is better than 15, but it's still not good enough, right? I mean, it's um, at 15 million, we would eat through our reserve a lot faster than at uh, 11 million a year. 
but that's still too fast of a pace to start going through your reserve. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, this is this is definitely a head scratcher. <laughs> I mean, this is we're in a tough spot, particularly when you're showing your uh, uh, in your presentation the decrease in funding, both state and federal. Um, yeah, uh, I look forward to seeing what happens in mid month and uh, what you come forward with again toward the end of the month at the next board meeting. So I'd like to add that I do find it concerning that even at 10%, that only covers two months of salaries. So that's kind of a dangerous place to put ourselves in. And I commend the work of the staff to even get $2.2 million in cuts. So that's, that's a good start. I, I think we need to do a little bit better. I am hopeful always that the state and maybe federal government will throw money our way. But um, the, there's so many bills out there and so many com competing, conflicting bills so many budget priorities in the state of California. I would hate to rely on those hopes to set our budget. So please continue the work. I would agree with my colleagues here that, that return to the drawing board, please, and, and continue to look for ways. I'd like it to be strategic and clinical rather than getting to the point where we're saying, oh, let's just cut 10% off of everybody. Um, arbitrary cuts like that are harder to swallow I think they're not strategic, they're not effective, efficient. So maybe there's a way we can look at more strategic places to cut a little more. Thank you. I feel like we've we're all saying we're all saying something similar, but I think it's important that we give a more concrete directive here. And I would like that directive to be that for that budget that comes back to us in two weeks, mm -hmm. that it show a minimum of a ten percent reserve. Is the board comfortable with that? Well, let me let me ask. Uh, historically speaking, uh, from what you can tell, what has been the district's uh, highest reserve level? The highest is a little over twenty-one percent. Um, that was about I want to say that was pre-recession, right, Joy? Yeah, I think that was pre-recession. And I'd note that that's how we came through that recession, yeah. relatively yeah. unscathed yeah. compared to other yeah. districts. We didn't have layoffs, for instance. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's probably doable at this point to get to a 10% reserve uh, level. I think it's much more difficult to get to a zero net activity. So uh, just that's the caveat from my seat for this evening. But uh, I think a 10% reserve level is probably achievable. I understand that, actually appreciate that. Uh, I'm under no illusion that I think in a single budgetary year we're going to eliminate an $11 million structural budget deficit. Uh, but if we have the ability to somehow get to the 10 percent, I think that ought to be the objective. And I think that 2021, if we do nothing, <coughs> we'd have to find 18 the year after. That's going to be Just makes it impossibly yeah, painful. Exactly. Seven's going to hurt, but 18. Hurt a lot more. Am I seeing that we have consensus to give that direction? I think, did you catch that, everybody? Okay, thank you. I understand. I appreciate thank your you. support. Thank you. That brings us to agenda item 7.2, and this is also a public hearing. So I will now convene the public hearing at 7.04 on public hearing of 2019-2020 balances in excess of minimum reserve requirements. This is a first reading. Are there any public comments on this item, Ms. Kubek? Then I will close the public hearing at 7.04 p.m. and move it on to Mr. Little. Yes, thank you again, Dr. Patel. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge the revised document that was provided to you and to the public with some minor changes on it. So that's the report that we'll submit to the state. This is a report that's required pursuant to Senate Bill 858. Uh, and when we bring a board, uh, when we bring the board to budget to review and approve, we also have to publicly state uh, our balances in excess of the minimum state required reserve. So that's all that this does. Uh, the numbers tie to the numbers uh, in the previous report, although you have to work to get there. And I'm happy to walk you through them if there's some interest. But basically it's showing, um, we have to identify the purpose of any balances in excess of the 2% minimum reserve. Also, you'll note that the fiscal conditions 
related to Senate Bill 751, uh, which places a 10% cap on reserves for school districts are not being met, so that's not applicable for next year's budget. So again, this is just a first reading. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Little. Does the board have any questions? Thank you. We are now on agenda item 7.3. This is an action item. Amendment to Amendment 1 to 6th Project Agreement with K-12 Public Schools and Community Colleges Facility Authority for facility, facility Planning and Construction Support Services, Mesa Verde Middle School HVAC Project. Mr. Little. Yes, thank you, Dr. Patel. Uh, this evening, staff requests the board's approval to amend uh, our project agreement uh, with the K-12 Public Schools and Public Community Colleges Facility Authority, uh, which this county office of ed uh, runs uh, for the HVAC project that we have going on at Mesa Verde Middle School this summer. You'll recall that the board approved a $1.75 million allocation in March for the first phase, or what we thought was going to be the first phase of the project. And in looking at it closer, we decided it made more economic sense to do the entire project all at one time and get it done. We found, identified some funds that can pretty much only be used for capital facilities, obviously. Uh, and those are identified on the green sheet. And we're asking for the board's approval uh, for the project at about $2,519,400. And we anticipate getting the work done this summer. Thank you, Mr. Little. Are there any questions? All right, uh, can I hear a motion? Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Starting with Mr. Schwartz, is it a preferential vote? Aye. All the rest in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. We are now at agenda 8.0, Learning Support Services, agenda item 8.1, action item, ratification of stipulated agreements for student expulsion. Ms. Osborne. Thank you, Madam President. Tonight we bring forward five stipulated agreements for board approval. Thank you. For case number 2018-2019.20. Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second. And a motion by Ms. O'Connor Ratcliffe, second by Mr. Zane. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 4-0. Case number 2018-2019.22. Is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. A motion by Mr. Zane, second by Ms. O'Connor Ratcliffe. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 4-0. Case number 2018-2019.23. Is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second. And a motion by Mr. Zane, a second by Ms. O'Connor Ratcliffe. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 4-0. Case number 2018-2019.24. Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Mr. Zane, second by Ms. O'Connor Ratcliffe. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 4-0. Case number 2018-2019.26. Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Ms. O'Connor Ratcliffe, second by Mr. Zane. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 4-0. Agenda item 8.2, readmission of students on expulsion. Ms. Osborne. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Tonight we bring forward three readmissions of students on expulsion. All of these students have met the conditions of their contracts to be eligible for readmission or have met their graduation requirements. Thank you, Ms. Osborne. Case number 2018-2019.03. Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Ms. O'Connor Ratcliffe, second by Mr. Zane. All those in favor? Aye. Motion carries 4-0. Case number 2018-2019.04. Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Mr. Zane, second by Ms. O'Connor Ratcliffe. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 4-0. Case number 2018-2019.06. Motion to approve. There's second. Second. And a motion by Ms. O'Connor Ratcliffe, second by Mr. Zane. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 4-0. Case number 2018-2019.12. Motion to approve. Second. 
So a motion by Mr. Zane, second by Ms. O'Connor Ratcliffe. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 4 0. We're now on agenda item 8.3. This is a public hearing. I'd like to convene the public hearing at 8.10. This is a public hearing of Poway, Uni Poway Unified School District Local Control and Accountability Plan, LCAP, for 2019 2020. This is a first reading. Were there any public? Oh, 710. Sorry, 710. And we do have a public comment. Ms. Couvret? Janet Latang. No, you're supposed to go before. Public <laughs> hearing happens sorry. before. Good evening again, Superintendent Kim Spelt, Superintendent's Council and Trustees. Um, this year's current LCAP draft is approximately 250 pages of hard work and information for our PUSD employees and community. I appreciate that many of the comments from the community were taken into consideration in the creation of this year's LCAP. Um, let's see, I'd like to highlight a few e areas. Um, in goal one, action six and seven, the narrative says um, in 2019-20, the visual and performing arts vision for our district will be integrated in multiple years into the exploration educational program and refining at the secondary uh, level programs. Um, so goal, the, there's a budget shown for exploration and that stays about constant um, with exploration providing PE, STEM, and VAPA to all elementary students. Um, continuing the visual and performing arts area, goal four, action items one, two, and five show a slight planned increase in overall funding for music um, and uh, appreciate the support of the music programs again um, this year, at least in the draft. Um, let's see, as I shared during my community comment earlier this evening, there's quite a lot of community support for VAPA and all PUSD schools shared by the community um, during the LCOP comment process. Many of the community LCAP comments specified equity of VAPA program offerings for all PUSD students, which is also part of the mission of the VAPA strategic plan. Um, I appreciate there's continued funding for VAPA in this year's budget and encourage the district to work toward a high quality, equitable, standards-based VAPA education for 2021. Um, let's see, um, goal two shows the continued support of CTE, including additional CTE counseling support at the comprehensive high schools helping to support students' enrollment in POSD CTE pathways, which is super exciting for me to see that. Um, in goal three, uh, community input is reflected in the LCAP presented with its inclusion of the implementation of prioritized recommendations from the safety committee, as well as the continued maintenance of the school, safe school facilities. Um, and finally, I just want to support um, continued um, support of um, blended learning opportunities to access classes through multiple environments, including the expansion of online courses. The PUSD virtual course offerings are important to PUSD VAPA students and in particular marching band students who are balancing enrollment in their music classes and their core curriculum classes. And thank you for your continued support of the online course offerings. And I know these guys will say so much more exciting stuff, so I'm gonna give them the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there, are there any other comments? No other comments? So I will close the public hearing at 7.13. And now, Ms. Osborne. Thank you. Tonight, we will be providing a detailed presentation of the first reading of the 2019-20 Local Control Accountability Plan, or LCAP. As you can see by our outcomes, we will review our current and updated actions and services aligned with the LCAP goals, metrics related to the impact, as well as the budget that supports the goals, actions, and services. This is our third year in a three-year planning cycle for this LCAP. I would like to express my appreciation and thank our cross-department team that will be presenting tonight. tonight. Uh, it includes Mercedes Hubschmidt, our Director of State and Federal Programs, Joy Ramiro, Director of Finance, Doug Johnson, LSS Executive Director 2, who oversees our Assessment and Accountability Department. Our LCAP goals align and support our Poway mission of college and career readiness for all, ensuring students engage in rigorous 21st century learning, continue to develop and maintain communication systems with all stakeholders, and create collaborative learning culture for all. 
the local control funding formula lists eight state priority areas that every district must include and show how the areas are addressed through the LCAP. These eight priorities include basic services, ensuring appropriate credentials and placement assignments for our teachers, standards align instructional materials and facilities in good repair, implementation of standards for all students including English learners, parent involvement, pupil achievement, pupil engagement which includes attendance rates, chronic absenteeism, dropout and high school graduation rates, school climate which includes our suspension and expulsion rates, course access and other pupil outcomes. As a reminder, these are our five LCAP goals. Number one, support high quality teachers with standards aligned instruction. Create systems and structures that provide multiple pathways to increase college career and life readiness. Goal three, strengthen safe, healthy and positive learning environments. Goal four, increase parent and student engagement through enhanced community involvement. And goal five, develop collaborative learning structures and systems for all learners to advance student achievement. As you know, the LCAP process is an iterative process that includes feedback and review from our district advisory and English learner advisory, which occurred just last evening. Dr. Phelps will respond to this feedback, which, which will be posted on our LCAP website publicly. We've also engaged with a review process with the San Diego County Office of Education. This review utilizes a detailed rubric and provides us with specific feedback for our plan, which we've already begun to address and incorporate. I will now turn this presentation over to our team, beginning with Joy Romero, and we will take questions at the end of the presentation, if that's all right. Thank you. Good evening. So one of the most, oh, one of the important changes in the LCAP template for the school year 2019-20 is the requirement for district to develop a local control funding formula overview for parents in conjunction with the LCAP. So this chart shows the total combined general fund revenue PUSD is projecting to receive in the coming school year 2019-20 from all sources. So as mentioned earlier by Mr. Little, this amount will not match the slide that you have seen in the budget presentation because this is strictly revenue only, no transfer in and other sources. So this will include the revenue we receive from the state funds under the local control funding formula, other state funds, funding from federal and local. The LCFF funding includes a base level of funding and the extra funding called supplemental and concentration grant, which is based on the enrollment of high need students. Based on PUSD's UPP of 23.14%, we are entitled to receive the supplemental grant, but not the concentration grant that requires 55% unduplicated percentage. The total revenue we are projected in 1920 is close to 393 million, of which 324 million or 82.5% is the local control funding formula. Of the 324 million, 310 is the base grant, 310 million is the base grant, and 14 million is the supplemental grant, again, generated based on the district's unduplicated student. The 45 million of the projected revenue is the other state fund. This will include the funding we receive for special ed program, mental health, mandate block grant and lottery, we are projecting 10 million to receive from federal funds to for impact aid to Title I, Title II, Title III, Special Ed IDA, and all other federal programs. Also included in our projected revenue is 13.2 million of local revenue for interest from county treasury, funding for ACES program, revenues from transportation fees, use of facilities and all the donations that we are projecting to receive. PUSD continues to implement the district's strategic plan towards improving student outcomes while maintaining fiscal responsibility. This slide is to briefly describe the budget in the combined general fund expenditures for the LCAP year 2019-20. The district's total proposed expenditures in the general fund combined is 409 million. Again, this will not match the slide that you have seen in the budget presentation. 
this, not, this will not include the transfer out. So this is strictly expenditures only. 375 million or 92% of the total combined general fund budget will be directed towards meeting the LCAP goals, but not all are tied or linked to the actions and services of the district's LCAP. Of this amount, 350 million, the green bar, is to cover the cost of the general operation of the district. This includes salaries and benefits of our qualified teachers and all of the support staff, funding for textbooks, our curriculum, software licenses, instructional materials, etc. 24.5 million of the projected expenditure budget is allocated to routine and restricted maintenance and repairs, deferred maintenance, grounds and custodial services, and to fund the implementation of the guidepost recommendation for site safety. The remaining 34 million of the budget is for other operating expenses like utilities, insurance costs, capital payments, and all other operating expenses. The local control funding formula gives school districts more flexibility in deciding how to use the state funds. In exchange, school districts must work with parents, educators, students, and the community to develop a local control and accountability plan that shows how we will use the LCFF funding to serve our students. So as shared in the previous slide, the district's total budget for expenditures for next school year is almost 409 million. Of that amount, 43.5 million is linked to the actions and services within the LCAP five goals. This slide will show a quick summary of the funding sources of the PUSD's LCAP budget for the next school year. So 14.1 million we are projecting to receive for supplemental grant is included in the LCAP budget. 18.7 million of the budget is coming from the LCFF base grant. 7.6 million is other state and federal funds. CTE funding of over a million, a small amount from the county of 116,000, and two million of restricted lottery funds. Also included in the new LCAP template for 2019-20, is for district to provide an overview of the current year LCAP expenditures. So this chart will compare the PUSD budgeted 2018-19 LCAP versus what we are estimating our actuals will be. So last year we presented a, pro a proposed LCAP budget of 42 million and we are estimating the actual expenditures will be 40 million. The difference between what we budgeted and the estimated actuals will be carried over in the next school year. As far as actions and services that contribute to increasing or improving services for our high need students, the unduplicated students, the difference between what we budgeted of 12,966,000, which is the blue bar, and the estimated actuals of 12,904, which is the green bar, is around 62,000. This amount has no impact to the actions and services provided to improve the services given to high need students in our district. So now let me turn it over to Director <laughs> of Learning Support, Mercedes Harrison. Thank you, Joy. We're pleased to be able to share with you a brief overview of our current 2018-19 work through our LCAP and the proposed 2019-20 actions and services with associated budgets. As we begin with goal one of supporting our high quality teachers as they implement standards based curriculum, instruction and assessment, please note, on the left hand side of the slide, you will see this year's actions and services. Those actions and services continue into 2019-20. On the right are the new proposed 2019-20 actions and services moving forward. As you can see, we, can con we continue to focus our alignment of academic and performance standards to the California state standards and those content areas listed on the left. You will note the addition of math support classes, upper level math, and beginning history social science in the coming school year. We will continue to support our new hires with training and coaching. Given last year's CERT, we will maintain the level of funding for our Poway Professional Assistance Program, PPAP, established last year, meeting the goal of supporting high quality teachers throughout our district. 
Three years ago, we initiated important work with response to intervention and instruction teachers on special assignment. As you know, intervention is ongoing, supporting the needs of our students both academically and social emotionally, as well as the support of our teachers and staff who work with our students. Our site level RTI professional learning leaders and TOSAs have met many times throughout the school year, building their efficacy as they receive training in effective strategies such as restorative practices and tier two behavioral interventions. Moving forward, the next phase of our intervention model will shift to three K through 12 intervention TOSAs, who will focus on building capacity of all staff, support professional learning, and a deep understanding of strong first teaching. We continue to work toward ensuring that our students access those essential supports needed for wellness and success as we move to multi-tiered systems of support. Our exploration program has increased collaboration time for teachers, providing time to discuss interventions and strategies for our students, not at grade level, while continuing the opportunity for enhanced instruction, including that of units of study in the visual and performing arts. Now, Mr. Doug Johnson will show metrics associated with this goal. Good evening. In uh, support of goal one, it is important to review our California School Dashboard results as previously shared at a December board meeting. Based on our third to eight and 11th grade students overall performance on the Smarter Balance Assessments, our students performed at the very high level five blue level in the OA with some of our student groups performing at lower levels as displayed on the slide. Our African American and students with disability student group performance declined, while our Hispanic stu student group maintained their performance. In math, our students' overall performance on the Smarter Balance Assessment was also deemed at the very high level five blue, with some of our student groups performing at lower levels. Our African American and students with disability student groups declined in their performance while our Hispanic students maintained and our homeless and socioeconomically disadvantaged students increased their performance. Our 2018-19 goal was to maintain overall performance at level five with increased student group performance. For our 11th grade students, their performance on the Smarter Balance Assessment served as an indicator of readiness for college level coursework in English language arts and mathematics. This is termed the Early Assessment Program, or EAP. For our PUSD juniors in 2018, 73% were deemed college ready in English language arts and 58% in mathematics. These percentages note a decline from the previous year's students' performance. Our 2018-19 goal was to see a 2% increase in both disciplines. For the first time, the state provided districts on the California School Dashboard with a college career indicator via a prescribed criteria that was shared at an earlier board meeting. PUST students performed at the very high, level five blue. This represented an increase of 0.7%. Our English learners, Hispanic and socioeconomically disadvantaged student groups increased, increased their performance from the previous year. Our African American performance maintained while our students with disabilities and homeless declined. The following data was shared at an earlier board meeting as well. PUSD was reported to have a slight increase in the number of students in both ELA and MAP performing at the MET or exceed standards levels. Our 2018-19 goal was to increase overall student performance at ELA by 4% and mathematics by 2%. We continue to monitor our student group performance and align instructional approaches to meet the needs of all our students. This chart shows the proposed budget for LCAP goal number one of 14.8 million. 7.5 million coming from the LCFF base, 5.4 million from supplemental grant, and 2 million from the restricted lottery. Closing those achievement and opportunity gaps for all of our students is the focus of goal two. Thus you will see the carryover of the 1819 actions and services and the new proposed action and services on the right. In addition to continuing our pathways of academic support, 
We look to strengthen our services to students with special needs as we move toward a least restrictive environment district-wide via the newly piloted SAI model. The new funding from the Low Performing Student Block Grant, three math intervention TOSAs will be hired to support professional learning, coaching, and facilitation of lesson study cycles. These three-year positions will focus on improving the academic outcomes of our students. We will continue to increase and strengthen our career and technical education pathways for our children as they explore their passions through a variety of opportunities. This continued rich work includes closing the achievement gap through varied programs such as site-led interventions and enhancing our nationally recognized programs. Last month, we were pleased to formalize our long-standing partnership with Palomar College at our May 21st board meeting. Through this partnership, an exciting opportunity for our students comes as we explore middle college as an option for our students to both accelerate and thrive. As we create those systems and structures to support our children at the elementary level, we implemented a district-wide early intervention tool, SIPS, to accelerate their reading in order to bring students to grade level proficiency. We continue to enhance the supports of our English learners, providing professional learning for our teachers and instructional assistants, and to support the English proficiency of our English learners at the high school level. We look to fund an English learner TOSA to assist our teachers in developing high quality, standards based ELD instruction. All right, in support of goal two, we are pleased to report an overall increase in the number of students who have earned a C or better in an AP class and in the number of students who have passed at least one AP exam. Our goal was to increase the percentage of students passing an AP exam by 1%. We exceeded that goal. Additionally, we are pleased to report some of our dramatic student group increases as noted on the slide. Likewise, we are also pleased to report the increase in the number of students who have completed the APG UC CSU course sequence with some of our student groups making substantial gains. Our goal was to increase by 3% overall and 4% for each student group below our district average. In reference to this goal, however, not all student groups made this increase. Our graduation rate continues to be quite high with the California School Dashboard indicating very high, level five blue. Our overall student goal is to increase our graduation rate by 0.01%. Uh, For all student groups below the district average, the goal is to increase the graduation rate by 0.05%. All groups met this criteria, except our African American student group, which reported a slight decrease of 0.2%. Our English learner progress on the California School Dashboard was presented as status only as our state has transitioned to a new assessment, the English Language Proficiency Assessment for California, LPAP. The data presented on this slide represent our baseline information. 83% of our students perform at the three or four level compared to 65% of English learners in the state of California. PUSD continues to focus on providing our students with career technical education, CTE pathways. However, this past year, we did see an overall pathways completion rate decrease by 7%. Our goal is to see a 1% increase each year with 2% increase for each of our student groups below the district average. The state of California redefined the manner in which they calculate CTE completions. This has led to some new actions that will be undertaken this year. Provide incentives for teachers to obtain a CTE credential in addition to their single subject credential. Secondarily, a CCI tool will be provided for counselors to use to identify a student's progress toward pathway completion. We are pleased to report that considerably more of our 2018 graduates took three or more mathematics courses during their high school experience. Noted on the slide are the impressive student group increases. Our 2018-19 goal was to increase this number by 2%. Also, we have seen an increase in the number of students who are enrolled in an advanced placement course. Our 2018-19 goal was to increase this number by 2% as well. 
our addition of a half-time intervention counselor at our high schools to monitor our students' four-year scheduling continues to be a key benefit for our students. PUSD will continue to build on our current systems to promote equity and access for all students. In support of goal number two, 12.8 million is the total proposed LCAP budget. Five million is coming from LCSF base, of which three million is for the QTE program, 3.3 million from supplemental grants, another 3.3 million from other states and federal funds, TCAG grant of 1 million and 116,000 coming from the county. Thank you. Goal three. <coughs> Goal three focuses on safety, the physical, the social, emotional, and our phys physical facilities. As we review goal three, you'll note the 2018-19 actions and services that will carry over and the proposed 1920 actions and services moving forward. Physical facility assessments were conducted in order to identify areas of need for the safety and security of our schools and offices. We look to prioritize and implement those recommendations. Last year, we added three counselors at the middle school level and increased our psychologists. All sites also participated in suicide prevention and mental health support training. Based on needs identified by our school sites and community, we are excited to share the increase of a .5 counselor at each of our comprehensive high schools. These .5 counselors will focus on the integration of career and technical education at our secondary sites, as Ms. LeTang shared earlier. <laughs> we created a school safety committee that included staff, first responders, parents, and students, which developed a district safety plan and recommended prioritized actions. As part of this work, we are broadening options-based district-wide training for schools and departments to include new staff and looking at students as well. The success and engagement of each of our students is important to us. Later this month, each of our school sites will be sending a site team to learn more about positive behavior intervention and supports with noted expert Dr. Jeff Sprague. Critical to this work is the need for restorative practices as we look toward reducing suspension thus both supporting and nurturing the relationship between student and school. <coughs> Additionally, we continue to intervene with our potential dropouts at our middle and high schools, which currently stands at eight students total for our district. Last year, we were fortunate to be awarded a three-year Education of Homeless Children and Youth grant. As we move into our second year of this grant, we continue to assess the needs of our family exper families experiencing homelessness and implement services to ensure that they have equitable outcomes for our youth in transition. In reference to goal three, the state of California utilizes the California School Climate, Health, and Learning Surveys to provide data which can be used to improve student academic per performance and social emotional, behavioral, and physical health for all youth. Three surveys are provided to the district. One for students in grades five, seven, nine, and 11, the California Healthy Kids Survey, one for parents of all grades, the California School Parent Survey, and one for staff, the California School Staff Survey. The surveys are administered on an every two-year cycle. PUSD students, parents, and staff completed the surveys in the fall of 2018. The data recorded on this slide is derived from the 2018-19 student and parent surveys and display specific district LCAP goals. The 2018-19 goal was to see an increase of 2% in positive responses as compared to the 2016-17 data. Sites were provided their TICS survey responses. Information from these surveys is currently being utilized and analyze at each of our school sites in order to enhance positive school cultures and to provide comprehensive positive behavioral interventions and supports PBIS systems for our sites. As reported on the California School Dashboard, our suspension rate was deemed medium at level three yellow. Our 2018-19 LCAP goal was to see a decrease of 0.6% from the previous year. However, we saw a slight increase of 0.3%. This is work that we continue to employ in regard to our social emotional and restorative justice programs and supports for all our students. As noted on this slide, more of our students have passed five of the six physical fitness tests in fifth, seventh, and ninth grades. 
how elementary teachers and PE teachers continue to provide a comprehensive standards-based program for our students. To maintain safe, clean, and positive learning environment, for goal number three, the proposed budget is 11 million. We have LCSF base of 3.9 million, supplemental grant of 5.4 million, other state and federal funds of 1.6 million. And goal four, we have long enjoyed a strong partnership with our community in engaging and ensuring the success of our students. This is reflected in goal four. In addition to our 18-19 actions and services, we will broaden our Mandarin 50-50 dual immersion program at Adobe Bluffs to include first grade. We value the support given our district from the Confucius Institute. We will continue to implement and broaden the participation of students in our Korean language program at D39. This program is supported via a grant from the Foundation for Korean Language and Culture in the United States and is offered as an elective during the instructional day. <coughs> Engaging our students in various programs while partnering with our parents is important to decreasing absence rates. Working with our parents, we can strategize ways to bring our students back into their education. We recognize that this may mean different pathways in order to engage our students. As we increase parent participation, we continue to explore ways to assess parent engagement and involvement. This year, we launched Thought Exchange as a means to gather stakeholder engagement for our local control and accountability plan. Over 9,000 stakeholders, 6,000 of those identifying as parents, provided feedback on the most important things to focus on as we continue our, to our work to support all students. We continue to support partnerships with businesses, such as internships with Northrop Grumman, as well as our Studio 701 digital media program, which produces our monthly excellent e excellence in education videos. One of the most exciting opportunities for our students is through our partnership with Palomar College. In addition to the discussions about middle college and dual enrollment, Palomar continues to support the Palomar Promise. This promise ensures that the first year of Palomar College is free for our students, supporting their success as they begin their post-secondary journey. Consistently, we strive to broaden the engagement of both our parents and students as they become college, career, and life ready. In support of goal four, our California School Parent Survey reported a high level of parent engagement in our schools. In comparison to the 2016-17 survey, 1% fewer of our parents agreed with this statement. Our 2018-19 LCAP goal was to increase our parents' perception by 2%. At all of our sites, staff continues to discuss strategies to enhance parent involvement in our schools. Our attendance rate has remained steady. Of course, it is our desire to increase this rate to the district goal of 97.5%. Sites continue to closely monitor attendance through a variety of means. As Mercedes mentioned, although our drop rate, rate remains quite low, we are committed to curtail this rate by strategies utilized at our high schools. As reported on the California School Dashboard, our chronic absenteeism rate increased by 1.4% from the previous year. This placed our district in high level two orange band. Our LCAP goal was to decrease chronic absenteeism by 1% each year for all students and 2% for each student group below the current district average. In regard to our chronic absenteeism rate as a district, we have focused on a systems approach to decrease our chronic absenteeism rate. A tiered approach has been initiated this past year. Monthly messages are sent to each site to stress the importance of regular attendance. Many of the messages encourage parents to avoid taking vacations during school days. Each of our school sites has been given access to chronic absenteeism data, which is available in our district student report center to provide real-time review and intervention. In addition, counselor, teacher, and parent meetings have been held on a more regular basis <coughs> to support families and individual students. Intervention strategies have been provided for each site as communicated from our attendance and discipline department. Particular assistance has been focused on supporting military families, youth in transition, and foster youth. Okay, in goal number four, 1.2 million is included in the LCAP budget. 
mostly coming from the LCFS based fund and a small amount from supplemental and state and federal fund job 88,000. Goal five. Collaborative strong learning structures for both students and staff are the focus of goal five. We continue the expansion of blended learning opportunities for learners, which include professional development and embedded coaching models for support. Our Voyager program models this embedded coaching model by building teacher capacity around the areas of blended learning, flexible learning environments, purposeful technology integration, and meaningful feedback to support student-centered learning opportunities. Through PSEA's professional partner program, our new or probationary employees, as well as employees who need additional support, are assigned an experienced and trained mentor as a partner for success. Professional learning and support via PPAP, the Teacher Professional Learning and Effectiveness System, effectiveness system TPLUS, and our Teacher Flex Day not only provide options for our teachers, but honor professional choice in their learning. Our Teacher Learning Cooperatives, or TLCs, allow for increased alignment with district initiatives, such as AVID, the utilization of benchmark advance, next generation science standards, technology, and intervention. We look forward to continuing with our partnership with the PFT and our PSEA as we support both the TLC and the classified learning cooperative, the CLC, in support of outstanding professional learning for our certificated and classified staff. Finally, as we strive to create, create conditions and cultures to support world-class learners, the actions and services found in our 2019-20 LCAP continue the deep work that we embarked on this, the 2018-19 school year. Our TLC participation continues to grow each year. Teachers continue to engage in professional learning endeavors that will enhance their teaching focused on our district initiatives. During the 2018-19 school year, 870 certificated employees participated in the teacher professional learning and effectiveness system. This includes all classroom teachers, resource specialists, librarians, and speech pathologists who, who participated in TPLUS this year. Out of the 870 participants in 2018-19, 57.5% participated for the first time. Overall, teachers have participated in a variety of learning opportunities beyond the TLC process. ELA, ELD site leaders have met and trained all of our K-5 teachers in utilizing our newly adopted ELA, ELD benchmark advanced curriculum. We have also continued our focus on early literacy training for all TK teachers in phonemic awareness intervention programs to accelerate learning and reading. 35 TK through two teachers participated in the Poway Unified Reading Academy that focuses on five key components of reading. All of our TK through five teachers have engaged in trainings that support the teaching of the California Next Generation Science Standards via the work of our professional learning leaders in science. Middle and high school science teachers continue their professional learning this year in preparation for teaching new units with new content and shifting their instructional practices to line up with three-dimensional learning and the science and engineering practices. High school math teachers receive professional learning for teaching new integrated math curriculum. This professional development focused teachers on not only the new content, but also facilitating math discussions, managing productive struggle, and shifting assessment practices. All world language teachers continue their professional learning this year, focused on instruction in the target language, use of authentic resources, the modes of communication, proficiency guidelines, and teaching grammar in context. Classified employees have increased their participation in professional learning opportunities as noted, including participation in the classified learning cooperatives. PSEA reports the following update to this metric. 150 classified employees participated in the professional partner program, 33 classified employees in the educational financial incentive program, 30 classified staff attended four special education instructional assistance workshops, and 1,500 employees attended two professional growth days with 76 breakout sessions. Okay, in support of LCAP goal number five, a budget of 3.8 million is included, base fund of LCFS of 1.1 million, 
50,000 from supplemental grants and 2.6 million of other state and federal funds. So we will um, complete our presentation and open up for questions. Our next steps are last evening we met with um, the district advisory and district English learner advisory. They provided us feedback and input, so we'll be reviewing that. The draft LCAP is available for review and input between now and our um, June 27th board meeting, which we will be bringing back um, our revisions to the LCAP for a request for approval for the final draft of the LCAP. And then um, following that, we will be submitting the adopted LCAP plan to the San Diego County Office of Education for their final approval. And I'll open it up if you have <coughs> questions. Thank you very much. Thank you to the presenters as well. Does the board have any questions at this time? Mr. Schwartz? Hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, very clear and very colorful. Kept me interested. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I noticed that the attendance rates you shared were 94.6%, um, but what I'd previously seen from Mr. Little wasn't it usually around like 96%. Um, it said a decrease of 2.4%, which is huge considering ADA money, et cetera. So I was wondering what that what the difference is for and where that metric came difference. from yeah that was that was the latest one that I that I located in my data but I can definitely go back and check that for uh, accuracy thank you you're welcome could that be a one month only and not a year average could have been something that we it would, is yeah. the end of the year yeah. yes Thank you very much. This is a ton of information. <laughs> we are swimming in data here, and it would have been great to get this before today so we could have some more thoughtful comments um, off the top of our heads here. But swimming in data here, and what are we doing with this data? That's what I want to know. Are we really looking to see why our numbers and our percentages went up or down? Um, maybe even on a site-by-site -site basis so that we can duplicate our successes or really focus on our problem areas to improve them. Are we asking sites to analyze their numbers? Hi, Michelle, as you recall, every year that we um, conduct our work in the single plan for student achievement, where we then reflect on all this data at each of the sites, and then with our teams, we devise our programs and strategies that we are then going to employ and then getting better at really looking at what we're doing and then measuring the impact in a tighter fashion. I think that's one of our bigger goals. I know one of the things that we've been looking at in terms of smarter balance assessments is a state has what they call interim assessments that you can do along the way that a lot of our schools and teachers have been implementing more so um, as we've gone forward. And that's really helping us having a tighter written, taught, and tested format because a lot of this data obviously is derived from smarter balance. And, you know, we're, we don't do everything every day in class to align with smarter balance, you know, you're not for a test. But we need to look at that and have tighter alignment with that so we can really get a true measure of how our kids are doing over time. So I am, the interim assessments really are growing more and more from the state. So teachers get a more access to what are those items, what are the depth of knowledge questions that kids are really asked to do, and then we do more of them, especially in the performance tasks. Because the Smarter Balance test is based on kind of the multiple, multiple choice and then a performance task in ELA, math, and science. And where the rubber meets the road is the performance task. The state gives you much, many more points when kids can perform on a, at, a, at a better level on that performance task, because that is what the Common Core standards are leading toward. And I think Ms. O'Connor Ratcliffe as well, when you have opportunity in the annual update. So one of the things we have to do each year is based on what we did for last year, we have to report on the metrics and kind of like how things panned out, right? So in the annual update, which is in the front of the document, um, you'll see that there is a report around specific metrics and then the actions and services and kind of like what actually happened with them. And then as you go kind of a little bit lower in, the, in that section for each of the goals, it asked us basically what was effective. 
And so it, it, it kind of, you know, I, I, I agree. The data is, you know, we work with it a lot, and it, it's a lot for us as well. But it sounds like we might actually be a year behind. In when some, we in analyze some, our the, data, in, in we're one the, year back. In some of them, in, in, based on the way we receive the data from the state of California, so that is, yeah, it is that is very challenging. You're correct. And I'm not crazy about the idea of throwing more standardized tests at our kids when, to get more more data on an interim basis. Either, if we're going to do that, we need to subtract some of these other things. I. That's exactly <laughs> what we're looking at. We're looking at yeah. where, what is the new benchmark curriculum, what assessments are there, how are we using the universal screening, how do all these pieces fit. And so that we They'll can reduce maps redundancy three times a exactly. year too. And, and we're working on looking at maps and looking at when is that needed or is it needed. So we're looking at all of those assessments to make sure that we are um, making sure there's time for teaching and learning, and not just testing. Okay. Didn't say that earlier. Yeah, okay, because I'm glad to hear you say that because when I look at, and I didn't look closely, but I did look at least briefly to give it an overview. Our our chicks looks not great in middle school in particular. Um, standardized tests aren't the only thing at fault for that, but that's, that's concerning. We have a lot of other things to do than, than pick up our, our academic measures. The, the, the kids are not rating their experiences where we would like to see it, obviously, and I, I'd love to have some concrete ideas coming through about how, how are schools fixing that. I'd love for the board to hear more about it. I'd and unfortunately, what we see nationally is, is, is the trend. And, and it's, and it's, it's not seeing the test. Of course, it's not definitely not okay with us as well. I think when we start looking at some of the things we want to implement around positive behavior intervention and supports, when we look at um, the additional counseling, when we look at restorative practices, um, part of the rationale be behind bringing in site teams, you know, so we brought the, the, the expert here to us so we can be able to, to really kind of maximize um, that professional learning for our school sites so that we provide that time so that schools can maybe, you know, start looking at developing a plan. I, I know that, that um, it is something that, w that we also recognize and, and we are looking at what are those tangible, targeted uh, actions and services that we can do to address those concerns. Yeah, because I love that I, we can point to the things we're trying to do, but are, which ones are effective and which ones aren't. They sound good, but they're not working. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I understand that the year behind is kind of frustrating, but we, we're rolling with it as fast as we can. To yeah. Any other questions from the board? I do want to point out, I, I found it particularly concerning some of the areas that seem consistent for decreases, and I hope that, and I'm sure, that there is significant effort being put into those areas, and I look forward to seeing the outcomes of that. Absolutely. Because I know you see that data, too. You're not just showing it to us. Um, and on the chicks data, I kind of looked into that a little bit in detail. I, the social-emotional piece is very important to me. I noticed that with our high school students, and I'm sure you noticed it, too, that they're achieving very highly, they're very engaged in their work, but their opinion of the meaningfulness of it seems low. And I think that's particularly telling for our high school students. They wanna do well, they're trying hard to do well, but they're doing well to please us and not to do meaningful work for themselves. And I think that's something maybe systematically we should be looking at. Thank you. No other comments? Thank you very much. Thank you. That brings us to agenda item 11.1, .1, approval of regular board meeting dates for 2020. This is the second reading. Dr. Phelps. Thank you, Madam President. Tonight we bring forward for a second reading of our 2020 regular board meeting dates. Are there any questions or concerns in regards to these dates? I will just point out that a lot of them are not second Thursdays, so can we, um, communicate out to our school staff to try not to schedule important things on board meeting nights that maybe we would like to participate in like that's our own schools yeah events. that's an important <laughs> reminder if we can we'll make sure that our school site administrators are aware of these board meeting dates and that we will not schedule uh, major school events on those evenings thank you with that do I hear a motion motion to approve second and Mr. Schwartz? Aye. And the rest of the board, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0.
Thank you. We are now at agenda item 12.1, board member reports. I'll start at the end, Mr. Schwartz. <clears throat> Hello, Power Unified School District, committee members and staff. It is with a heavy heart that I report to you one last time. Over the course of these past 12 months, I've met so many amazing people. I've grown close to my very respected board members, uh, worked alongside Dr. Phelps and her team of associate superintendents, and made many collections with the Office of Education and the government. I have attended tens of events across the county and advocated for students' wants, as well as met with almost every associate superintendent to learn about their areas of expertise. I would just want to share my fondest memory over the course of this last year would either be getting to attend the entire weekend dedicated to just school board activities at the CSBA AAC conference, or getting to judge the amazing duct tape fashion show at Valley Elementary School, where they actually gave me handouts of duct tape things, which I have in my room. Um, <laughs> still, all the memories I have in this job have been great ones. Although I have not been exactly able to change any specific policies, I believe I have achieved great success in publicizing the Board of Education, acting as a liaison between students and the district, and representing student voice during every board meeting. I want to close by saying I only have positive things to say about the school board and the P Power Unified School District staff, students, parents, and personnel. I am certain that under the lead of the many leaders in our district, PUSD will only become better. I look forward to seeing what everyone ha here has accomplished when I come visit a board meeting during my vacations from college. That's the first thing I want to do. <laughs> Thank you for a fantastic year. I wish you all the best in your future. And remember, students are the core of this district. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. Mr. Zane? Well, thank you. I'll keep it very brief and save a more extended uh, board report for next board meeting, which is just a couple weeks away. Uh, but I would just like to uh, extend my uh, heartfelt thank you to the service of, I believe I'll call him Dr. Schwartz someday. <laughs> um, and uh, it's been a pleasure getting to know you. Uh, you're, you're a good man, and uh, I think you'll achieve great things. Uh, this all happened so suddenly, I didn't really get a chance to think about, I feel like we should have gotten him something. So immediately I'm thinking, well, I've got this cool drawer right here, and I've been aging these Swedish fish for, <laughs> for some time. And there's this, th I'm pretty sure this is a staple remover, which I really think <laughs> you might want to use in college. Um, take it with you to DC, use them well. Um, You've offered me this way fish before. <laughs> <laughs> um, on a more serious note, uh, and again, uh, my, my last point for the evening, and I'll save a, more, a, a bigger report for the next meeting. Um, I hope some of you, or I hope all of you, took at least a moment today, and you still have an opportunity to do so uh, before you put your head on the pillow tonight. Uh, to just give some thought to those who gave the ultimate sacrifice on the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Zane. Ms. Cabret? So I was lucky enough to attend a few functions with Jake, so I will miss him as well. But he had said he's going to be the youngest board member elected, so I'll be eager to see that after his studies for him to come back and sit on the board as an elected member. So. Um, um, I did want to run through a few things because we did have that wonderful honoring our own and I just think it's absolutely wonderful that we're able to recognize our fabulous team members um, in such a public um, stage. Um, on um, May 13th, um, we started the facility committee meetings um, which are absolutely fantastic and it's a great mix of the community um, and staff and personnel and other stakeholders. And with that, um, I attended the small meetings at Painted Rock, um, Tierra Bonita, and Highland Ranch. And it's really interesting to go to the different ones and hear from the parents, the PTAs, and the, and the, facil and the faculty there on what their needs are and what their ideals are. And although we're talking about big picture, some of them just want shape. Um, so we have to get those basic needs done first before we can dream about these big, these big ideas sometimes. Um, it's kind of ironic after this last report on the um, LCFF on the, um, the achievement gap and having college bound here because it's such a, p a fantastic program. We were lucky enough to go to the, um, the end of year celebration where I think we we're all in tears where the parents and the folks were holding on to their kids and wishing them well and telling them how much they love them and seeing the progress and the success of the kids in that organization, how we can encourage them to really excite their peers um, to also strive and achieve um, because they're the peers at that age group can sometimes have more influence than some of the, the teachers and faculty. Um, 
the meeting at Palomar College is super exciting. I think we'll also address that achievement gap. Um, I'm super excited to give these kids other opportunities to bring relevance um, to their education, as I just mentioned as well, and um, hopefully excite other kids for success. And what I really like is that they would be able to save money on tuition when it comes to college and lower that, that debt on students. They can gain confidence that they can be successful in a college atmosphere. So there's just a lot of pros to that, that, that coming on board. Um, finally, I wanted to um, acknowledge we had a wonderful speech from our superintendent at the Palomar Council Awards. Um, these, this is a group after my own heart because they, they do a lot of work for free. <laughs> And without them, our schools wouldn't be able to have music and art and dance in a lot of cases. So our volunteers are really important to us and our PTSA are fantastic um, partners that we have. And then um, finally, when we're talking about the social feeling of our kids, I was able to go to Shoal Creek and watch the kids work with a, um, a program called Thrively. And it was really neat, they were engaged um, and to respond in their own methods, be it typing or doing little videos of themselves. And our topic was bullying and filling each other's baskets with love. And um, their thoughts were really profound as little second graders. And what was great is the teachers were able to go in and read their thoughts and comments and respond with either a little heart or agree with them. But also they're able to identify how the kids are feeling in these different situations individually, which was really special. So I really enjoyed that as well, and that's it. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Ms. Kudret. Ms. O'Connor Ratcliffe. I went to a lot of things this month too. I, all, I, I will leave out everything that Ms. Kudret just mentioned, but um, well, Ms. Latang made it to the end, so I'll talk about VAPA. I've been to a lot of VAPA stuff this month. Um, Mesa Verde Middle School put on a great theater uh, experience, homage to the Twilight Zone, which was wonderful. Um, we had Westview hosting Introduction to Instruments for fourth graders. Um, I think they were from Adobe Bluff, Sundance, and Canyon View that day. That's a wonderful program to get them fired up to get into fifth grade band, show them each group of instruments and show them what it can sound like. And high schoolers are just as cool as it gets for fourth graders. So that was really fun. Um, I also went to a Mesa Verde band concert, which was wonderful to see progress to the end of the year. A Westview choir performance, that was a showstopper. Loved it, I wish I had seen Mount Carmel's because I heard that one was excellent as well. Um, I, I hit a lot of other events too. Mesa Verde, sixth grade Olympics. I have the girls high jump winner in my house. That was amazing. Um, D39 did their Maker Fair. I spent a lot of money. <laughs> Dulcer's Colonial Day was awesome. Um, as always, the Excellence in Special Education Awards, one of my favorite things that we do here. I couldn't stay the whole time. I had my son with me who absolutely appreciates everyone in that room and they all understand him perfectly and why we had to leave early. <laughs> um, but I love that one, the recognition from the parents of students receiving those services to the people who have helped their kids along the way and really stood out. And it's always a tearjerker too to hear the stories, the reasons that they were nominated by the families. Um, I wanna wrap it up here, I guess, but sitting this morning in this breezeway where I was freezing even though the sun was out at Mesa Verde outside the library helping check in textbooks, five days left, girls. I counted it down in my house. Um, I was just thinking what a good year it's been for Power Unified, and we heard a lot of that today. We've had the accolades rolling in for our district staff at every level, for our schools, our programs, our community partners, and our students are just off the charts. Um, but we, we've improved our accountability, we've streamlined a lot of our workflow, our community engagement has been really good this year. We have the really successful budget, technology, safety, and our VAPA committees. Um, our, our safety on our campuses, even if our, our surveys don't seem to reflect it, we've done a lot of work. And we've explored a lot of important changes in our policies. I'm partial to the work on our homework policy. Can't wait to see how that one pans out. Um, we expanded our Voyager program. I love all of the things that I've seen our kids doing with that. Our moving forward with our specialized academic instruction model schools to see how we can maximize inclusion 
and not forget any of our kids as we're moving on, making these improvements. Um, it's really just a tiny glimpse of what we've been doing all year long and what our staff and our kids and everyone has been working on. So yes, we have a lot of funding challenges. There is no doubt Sacramento is not living up to its part of the bargain and neither are those folks in DC. Um, but we are continuing to pursue these really important initiatives Establishing our middle college, um, expanding our special education inclusion work, our No Place for Hate curriculum, our facilities improvement. I mean, the list goes on and on, those and more. And we're going to continue pushing against all of these budget constraints as much as we can. I know we are advocating for every single one of our students, no matter what kind of category they might fall into. We're building our community up. Um, closing those gaps where we can in equity and in inclusion and in safety and in innovation. We've done it all this year and we're going to keep doing it. I'm really excited about sitting in on the promotion at Black Mountain 30 years after I was there. God, 30 years. Um, and hitting, hitting graduation at Westview where I could celebrate a family member who's graduating from there. So the end is nigh. I can't wait. I feel so lucky to be a part of this team and can't wait. Let's end strong. Thank you, Ms. O'Connor Ratcliffe. It's hard to follow that one. <laughs> but good evening, everyone. There certainly is a lot to report on for the activities of this last um, month, but I've selected just a few events to highlight tonight. Um, the uh, month started out for me with celebrations, uh, attending honoring our own celebration, where the San Diego Region AXA group recognized outstanding administrators of the year. Ms. Kubret touched upon that. And Quick pause. And they recognized this one. Again, I was trying to avoid that no, part. No, that's, that's important. <laughs> Top first year, wait, oh God, first term board member of the year right here. <laughs> but I'd, I'd really like to highlight that we set a record this year with seven award recipients. So congratulations to everyone again. I guess we just have to do better next year because we just keep breaking the record. Um, I was not able to participate in the tee-off for the foundation fundraiser, but I did join our PUSD staff in welcoming donors, including community members, staff, business leaders at the evening reception after the golf tournament. It really was wonderful to meet community members from such a diverse background in our community coming together to support the PUSD Foundation and all of its programs and efforts. It was really heartwarming to see that. As the CSBA delegate, I not only attend mon monthly meetings with our San Diego Region CSBA um, group, but I also attend two delegate assembly meetings a year. In our most recent statewide delegate assembly meeting, we were up in Sacramento, and we participated in a day-long set of panel speakers, breakout sessions, and report out sessions to address public education's challenges with special education. And we discussed areas ranging from financial commitments from the state and federal governments, or lack thereof, training to support um, teachers and staff as um, challenges with special education rise, the severity and variety are going up. We also talked about um, what we can do with our community members. And all the impressive part is all of the delegates came really prepared with all of their homework completed. And that meant that there was district staff in all of these districts throughout the state coming together to support this work, pulling together data from across the district on special education concerns. We were able to bring all of this, this data together and now we're building a platform that CSBA can use to intelligently and accurately advocate for special education needs throughout the state of California. It's actually very powerful work and I'm very impressed with the way it was organized. It was my first delegate assembly. I was also asked to give the opening speech so that was kind of odd for my first delegate assembly. Like my colleagues here, I was excited to hear about the prospects for Middle College through the partnership with Palomar College. From my understanding, we're still very much in early stages. I know we had a lot of questions. We're very eager and excited about it, and I'm looking forward to hearing all the updates that will be coming shortly, I'm sure. This month, I was invited to present at the Rancho Bernardo Kiwanis Breakfast Meeting. They start at 7 a.m. It was quite early, but there was lively discussion around our budget, facilities, master planning work, as well as our CTE programs and adult education. They were in, an engaged and inquisitive group of adults that were just excited about PUSD and ready to support us in our endeavors. And the month ended with celebrations as well, as would be expected for the end of the year. I was able to attend both the College Bound Awards night as well as the Palomar PTA breakfast, awards breakfast. 
Both awards programs show the dedication that our entire community has towards public education, and it's something worth recognizing and noting that the support comes far and wide and all the time. And that concludes my report. Thank you. That brings us to item 12.2, Dr. Fox. We have many recognitions of note to present to the board this evening, so I'll go through all of them tonight. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Please look at the board packet for the full description in 12.2. I encourage you to read them. In the interest of time, I'd like to highlight just a few. Two Westview High School students completed at the Intel International Science Fair where they received special awards and recognition for their research. Congratulations also to Poway High School for being named uh, a nationally recognized Project Lead the Way Distinguished School. Also, Del Norte High School's Rocketry Club students are now among the 101 national finalists in the Team America Rocketry Challenge. The students will compete at the national finals in Northern Virginia. This month, our Studio 701 interns covered the new launch lab at Pomerado Elementary School. It's a new way to expand our students' learning based on their students' strengths and interests. Take a look at their 17-minute video. <laughs> Robots roam the floor at Sony Electronics as power... Inside the launch lab at Pomerado Elementary School, students are exploring future careers in coding, media, business, and more. Even first graders excitedly discuss marketing strategies, employee benefits, and the fundamentals of running a business. I would like to be a pastry chef because um, I'm very good at um, baking and cooking and I would like to own my own business. Launch Lab activities always integrate with existing classroom curriculum. For example, if students are learning about goods and services and language arts, then they explore related careers in the lab. A lot of people that want to do enterprising are really social and they want to lead and pers persuade people and they want to take responsibility. Students learn about their personal strengths and passions to help them focus on potential career paths. I like to draw and like, I like to doodle too and it really has helped me to be like in the future to be an artist. In the launch lab I use the green screen the most and it gives me a different um, setting than what I would have in my regular classroom. We have a fourth grade student. He recently went to the library and asked um, our librarian for some books on being an engineer. He said he wants to go back to Guatemala where he still has family. He wants to build buildings there for people who don't have very much money. Inside of the lab, students take ownership of their learning and are motivated to pursue their interests outside of the classroom. The learning extends outside of school as well, with partnerships with other schools and businesses. We had an opportunity to partner with Poway High School and their ag program, and those students came and provided opportunities for students to know what it might be like to be a zoologist or a veterinarian or an animal trainer. Uh, in addition, we had an opportunity for students to attend the Petco Park and understand what it might be like to be a statistician at 
a major baseball field or a baseball with a baseball team or to be in their broadcast studio or to be in marketing. The Launch Lab provides a fundamental shift in how schools can prepare students for college and career readiness, setting them up for bright futures and endless possibilities as they grow into high school, college, and beyond. For the Excellence in Education series, I'm Damian Henson, Studio 701. Steve, dinner's on me. <laughs> Kudos to Jennifer Burks, Lana Nguyen, and Brenda Gillis, and Principal Laura Crow and her team for making the Launch Lab a success. Our hope is that it serves as a model for other schools as we expand college, career, and life readiness for our students. And many thanks to our 701 interns who created these awesome videos for us every single month. Several of them are actually graduating and pursuing majors in film and photography, so good luck and congratulations to those students. As we continue to look at how to meet the needs of all of our students, we are exploring a partnership with Palomar College to form a middle college for our PUSD students. Our Board of Education met with Palomar College at a special joint board meeting last week to learn about how our students can take college courses for free while concurrently enrolled in our high schools. Both boards expressed support for the project to move forward. I want to thank Kathleen Porter and her team for helping us to move this vision forward. I want to thank Jake for all of his continued service again, and you will be missed, so um, thank you so much. And finally, I can't believe that this is our last meeting before our school year ends, and I wanted to thank every single one of you in our audience this evening. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to come up, I'm happy to take a photo <laughs> with each of you. But thank you, everyone, <laughs> staff, students, parents, and board members for all of your hard work in completing another successful year. I want to congratulate all of our graduates who will walk across our stage next week to receive their hard-earned diplomas. It will really be, it's actually really a favorite time of year for all of us as we look forward to celebrating with all of you as you cross our stage. And so I want to thank all of you, and this concludes my report this evening. Thank you, Dr. Phelps. That brings us to agenda item 14.0, adjournment and next meeting announcement. The next regularly scheduled board meeting will be held on Thursday, June 27th, 2019 at 6 p.m. at the Powell Unified School District Office, 15250 Avenue of Science, San Diego. Stop. 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 No, 822. Stop. We are 822. Meetings adjourned. <laughs>